despair redeems Crowns me with his loving kindness High as the heavens above So great is his love Easter kids! My name is Mandy. I'm the Kids Community Director. Now, we have been walking through Lent together, and today we have finally arrived to Easter. Many of you guys, many of our families have had the Lent and Easter box to help you learn and grow at home and create. We have seen some beautiful creations, and many of you have been caring for your plants that we will plant out in our garden in maybe a month or so. Keep taking care of those. How many of you have been opening the Holy Week eggs? You had a bag of eggs in your box. I have today's egg. Have any of you opened it yet? I'm guessing you've been pretty busy. You maybe haven't. Let's open it and see what's inside. It is empty. Why is it empty? I bet you guys know. Of course it's empty because the tomb is empty. Jesus was buried and then they found it empty three days later. Jesus was no longer dead. He had risen and he is alive. You've probably also already read the Easter story from maybe one of your favorite Bibles at home telling you all about Jesus's resurrection. So I'm going to read a different story today going forward a little bit from Acts out of Acts 1. I want to tell you what happened next. Some of you already know, and some of you might be wondering, 
Jesus is alive, now what? What happens next? Why is today so important? Why is our faith in Jesus so important? Before I do that though, our band after I sing is gonna be singing a blessing song after over all of you. And I want you to be watching because there are pictures of many of you creating and experiencing Lent. So I want you to take time to look at that while you hear the blessing over you after I read our story. I'm gonna be reading from our Bible, the Children's Storybook Bible by Desmond Tutu, and it's called The Good News. Jesus stayed with his friends and spoke to them about all the things that had happened to him. He reminded them of the old stories about how prophets had promised that God would send his son to help God's dream come true. Jesus said, tell everyone everywhere that God loves them and that those who believe in the good news of God's dream should be baptized. And in a few days, my friends, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He then stretched out his hands and blessed them saying, I will be with you always to the end of time. A cloud came from heaven and Jesus disappeared. The disciples stared up into the sky looking for him. Two men in white robes appeared. Why are you looking up to heaven, they said. Jesus is not far away. He will always be close to you, even though you cannot see him. And one day, he will return in the same way that he left you. The disciples went home singing praises to God. And our little prayer here says, Dear God, help me to know that Jesus is near. May you always know that Jesus is near. Happy Easter and receive this blessing. May God give you eyes to see all that is good, all that is good. The courage for anything. May you be strong. May Justice, my 
to have this beautiful band with us. Thank you guys for playing with us this morning. Happy Easter to everybody out there. Um, we are going to next hear about a painting that one of our lovely artists here at Awaken created for us, special for this Easter Sunday. Her name's Jenny Klukin, so take a look at this. My name is Jenny Klukin, and I'm a visual artist here at Awaken. And my main medium is acrylic flow painting, which is what you see here today. And I was first asked to make something for Easter Sunday and given the word unity as a prompt and later given John 17, 20 through 21. And when I, when I first started thinking about unity and I guess thinking about unity in today, in 2021, one of the, um, one of the color prompts or one of the the thoughts about color that I had was the signs that I've been seeing uh, for a while in people's yards that say all are welcome here with some stripes in the background and so that was where I decided to use my color inspiration and I made a few modifications just for artistic reasons one being Yellow does not participate very well with the kind of painting that I do, so I replaced it with gold, kind of a yellowy gold. And the, the trick with this style of painting is to allow each color to speak without creating mud. It's really easy to get a canvas covered in mud with this style of painting. So I work really hard and I use a couple different techniques to make sure that each color can be viewed separate from each other. And that that's what I did here, pouring each color individually and then starting to push them together and tip the canvas to make them move. What I was really going for in this painting is top to bottom seeing, seeing the four colors individually and then having them come together in sort of what I see as sort of a braid, uh, unifying together and then spanning out from there in a much more, I guess, after they've been braided together when they come out the bottom being a lot more integrated with each other. A lot more complexities can be found in the bottom of the painting than the top. I wanted the top to be individual colors without much complexity and then after they're braided together there's a lot more going on and I think that's what you see here that's what I was going for <laughs> um, but I just wanted to represent people coming together individually strengthening together and then being able to do more understand more accomplish more after that unifying experience happy Easter friends It's hard to believe that it's Easter, uh, but to my beloved church called Awaken, the most robust, uh, joy-filled, um, energy-filled welcome I can muster while no one is in the building, except for my friends. Um, but uh, it's resurrection morning, for crying out loud. This is the day that we, we celebrate, the day, the moment when Jesus, this guy who was from Nazareth, uh, killed at the hands of the Romans, was buried, and then resurrected from the dead. I mean, how else do you get the entirety of the human population to catalog its 
memories and events based on whether it was before or after your birth. Well, you got to be resurrected from the dead for that to happen. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's spring. The doors of the church are open. We got the band back together. I got a shot in my arm. Um, it's a good morning. It's a good morning. So I hope that you are well and I hope that uh, you, as Jenna said, Easter comes with all kinds of emotions, all kinds of different perspectives and memories maybe. Um, I was actually thinking about a memory uh, of my dad. Um, ironically, I, th I, th I think it was Easter. Um, even if it wasn't, it's still a great story. We're on our way to church. Uh, a bunch of my brothers and I in the car. My dad had a suit and tie on because we went to a church that, you know, men wore suit and ties at. Uh, very unlike Awaken, evidently. And uh, we stopped at the gas station at Lexington and Energy Park Drive to get gas in the car. And somehow, when he was taking the gas out of the, the thing out of the car, it just like spewed gasoline everywhere. And he got gas all over his shoes and all over his pants. And then just like blew a gasket right there in the parking lot on the way to church. So of course, we had to turn around, go home. He had to change. And uh, I, can, I, can, I remember the tie he was wearing on that morning. So... Whatever your memories are of Easter, I hope that this Easter is a good one for you. Uh, predictably, most pastors in the world on this morning will be preaching from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the resurrection texts, the one that Jenna read from. My favorite is from the Gospel of John, but predictably, uh, Awaken style, we're actually not going to be in any of those texts because we're finishing a series called The Power of a Letter, and we're going to be in John chapter 17 because John chapter 17 holds within it Jesus' longest, most heartfelt, um, like passion poured out um, section or, or, or words that we have in all of the scriptures. It's a prayer that he offers uh, in his last moments before he heads to the cross and crucifixion and then, of course, resurrection. Now, I believe there's no shortage of connections between that event and John, or the resurrection in John 17, which is why we're going to do that. But I'd be, I'd be passing an opportunity that most pastors think is a pretty important one if I didn't say just a couple of things about resurrection, right? Um, you know, let's just assume the whole story's true. Let's just assume for the sake of the, the illustration that it actually happened. Jesus was real. He was, a, he was a guy. He lived in Nazareth. He was born, raised, uh, you know, carpenter's son, the whole bit, taught for three and a half years, trumped up charges uh, against him by the Romans, and then killed, crucified, buried, and then resurrected from the dead. Let's assume that happened. If it did, the resurrection of Jesus Christ ensures a couple of things. Number one, that God has not abandoned this world, and we are, in fact, not alone. The Bible says a lot of things, but one thing it's trying to say from the beginning all the way to the end that the resurrection of the Son of God makes crystal clear is that God, the one in the Bible, uh, is a God that's deeply and intimately and passionately involved with, not absent from, our everyday and ordinary lives. There are some versions of God, maybe out there today, but certainly in the past, that sort of painted God as absent, um, you know, aloof, unconcerned with our reality, the insignificant lives of humans, basically that God was, had better things to do. The resurrection screams from the mountaintops that God has not abandoned the world and that we are not alone. It also says that death, evil, and the powers that seek to destroy do not win and cannot stop the relentless and reckless love of God. This is why this is one of the greatest stories ever told. It's why I would argue that any story that's good takes its cues from this story because it's that true. If death and evil are the enemy to the human, and I would argue they are, in this moment, the resurrection moment, all the power that seeks to destroy life and humanity, you know, the, 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 that God made and called good, is directed at Jesus in the form of death. And just when you think the music stops playing, did the phone just ring? God's calling right now. <laughs> he says, Micah, you're on to something. <laughs> when the music stops playing, the crowds disperse. You think the story is over and time is up? <laughs> Out walks Jesus from a grave. Like, you didn't see that one coming, did you? Ensuring that death and evil and all that it stands for has been called to account, beaten, destroyed, 
by the relentless love of God. It says the resurrection of Jesus, if it happened, and I would argue that it did, ensures that. Finally, it ensures that there is life in Christ, in Jesus, available to you right here and right now. Spring is so beautiful, right? We're starting to see things burst out of the ground. The tulips are active, like there are flowers coming up and bursting forth all around you. There is a flow, a life, a way of being human that is available to you right here and right now. The question is for us this morning is, will you step into it? Will you say yes to it? Will you step into that flow? Will you die to all the ways that stand against and, op- and, and, and stand in opposition to that way of being human that ultimately de- lead to death? And we kind of know that. And will you choose life, life in God, life in Christ by faith, which leads us to John chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Again, this is right before Jesus' death. In John 17, verse 13, we read this. I am coming to you now. This is Jesus speaking. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world. He's having this conversation with God, by the way. I'm coming to you now so that, uh, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer, Jesus says, is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Pray with me. God, this morning as we spend some time in this prayer recorded by John of Jesus, this letter as as it were to us, this moment that we get a glimpse into Jesus' heart, his hopes and his dreams. I pray that you would remind us who you are, who Jesus was, and who you intend for us to be. I pray in the strong name of Christ and by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Right now, I have a letter in my sock drawer. And that letter is a letter from my dad. Uh, Some of you know he passed away this last year from COVID. And... uh, That letter states his last dying wishes. Uh, Evidently, he and his wife met with a lawyer, attorney, somebody who does wills and estates, and was asking him about if there's anything he wanted in his last moments. And so when thinking about that, he wrote this letter and gave it to me, saying that should he, by some happenstance, be in a position where machines are keeping him alive, that his wishes were that we would let him go. You know, death has a funny way of crystallizing things for us. Like what we want, what we hope for, what we dream of, what we long for, seems to get very clear in those moments. You hear about it all the time. As people face the possibility of death, usually the most important things that that need to be said and the people, the most important people are gathered around. That's often the subject of the conversation. And Jesus, in this moment, John 17, is about to face death. This is one of the last moments before he's handed over to the authorities and his trial begins. And so we hear what matters the most to Jesus in this moment. Two things become very clear that seem to be Jesus' last wish for humanity, for those that know Jesus and those who may not know him. The first is that, we, that the world might experience what he has experienced. I only read about half of this prayer, but all through the prayer, Jesus makes mention of his experience with the divine life. 
And that experience is marked by oneness and unity. Verse 10, he says, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. He's talking to God. Verse 11 says, so that they may be one as we are one. Verse 21, just as you are in me and I am in you, verse 22, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus of Nazareth was a human being. As I mentioned earlier, he grew up in a town called Nazareth. He had a mother and a father, brothers. He had friends. He played games. He ate hummus, I'm assuming. He sweat. He probably cried. He worked in a shop with his dad. He got embarrassed. He was human in every way. He was like you and me. And yet there was this quality of life that Jesus experienced that he talks about which is connected to and plugged into the divine life, the creator of all things. If there's a God out there and we're not alone, and I would argue that there is and we are not alone, Jesus experienced union with this being, communion with this God. And this prayer in John seems to make clear, as do other passages in the Gospels, that Jesus had a unique experience of connection and oneness with God, which assumes two things. Some of us don't experience that number one, and number two, it's possible to experience that. For some of us, our experience of life on this earth, what we would call normal, is this a feeling of isolation or disconnection or uh, fracture or brokenness, uh, like lack of congruity. Our baseline is anything but union and oneness with the divine life. Our our normal uh, is estrangement. And we feel it deep in our bones, like in our souls almost. Jesus knows this, and his prayer reflects that. He prays for those who feel that. But it also assumes that it doesn't have to be this way. Again and again, Jesus longs for and prays for that what he has, you would have, I would have, we would have. This flow that Jesus tapped into, this way of being human, and testifies to being, that he testifies to being his everyday experience is available to you right here and right now. The very thing that blocks us from this connection with the divine has been dealt with. Sin, brokenness, whatever you want to call it, has been defeated once and for all in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's the good news of Easter, friends. The very thing that Jesus seems to experience as normal, which our hearts and souls and bones long for, is possible right here and right now. Jesus' dying wish as he goes to the cross of Calvary, his hope, his longing, is that you would experience and know to the bottoms of your toes that you are one with the divine, that there is a connection that you were meant for and you can have. And so to those of you who maybe have wondered about this, who have questioned it, who have heard this story and thought, I don't know about that. I would offer yet again on this Easter morning an invitation to you to consider if Jesus was real and if this happened. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, people ask me all the time, like, how do you know it happened? Well, I don't. But there is a mountain of evidence that it did. Time itself is cataloged by this person's birth. And if it is true, and he resurrected from the dead, an invitation is extended to you to say yes, to step into that flow, to this flow, this way of being human that Jesus testified to. I and the Father are one. Whatever you have is mine and whatever I am is in you. I don't know about you, but I think we desperately need that and want it. The second thing it seems to make clear in Jesus' dying wishes, is that those that know and have experienced a connection to this divine life, who had stepped into this flow and received it by faith, that you, me, we are the plan for those who don't yet know. (laughs) Again, like if you're going to make up a story, like this is not a good one to leave you and me in charge. Chuck Colson, who uh, evidently was involved in Watergate a long time ago, he's like, Watergate proves to me that the resurrection actually happened. Twelve guys who witnessed this thing testified to this fact for 40 years through estrangement, torture some, and death some. He's like, Watergate? Twelve guys couldn't keep a lie going for three weeks if their life depended on it. He's like, these guys, they couldn't have been lying. They kept it going for 40 years and it cost them their life.
what seems wild to me is that Jesus makes pretty clear in this prayer that the plan that the world might know this kind of experience, this kind of human life, connection with God, like, we're it. The church gathered here on Easter morning. So whether you think that's crazy or a little short-sighted or inefficient, it doesn't really matter because the reality is we are the divine plan that the world, those who don't know, will know. The connection, resonance, unity, oneness with God made possible through Christ has been left in our hands in some way, shape, and form. And Jesus names two things in verse 13 and 23 that he seems to think are going to be really important if we're going to succeed at this job. So to the church gathered this morning on Easter, that they might be filled with joy and that they might be one. Verse 13, he says, I am coming to you now. He's talking to God. But I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they, you, me, the church, that they may be, or that they may have the full measure of joy, my joy, within them. To a world that does not yet know of the life that is found in Christ, Jesus prays that we, the church, would be filled with a full measure of joy which seems ludicrous in the year that we've had. That is, of course, if joy depends on our circumstance. I'm not talking about the denial of reality or some sort of fake and contrived happiness in the face of difficulty. No, I'm talking about the unshakable foundation of joy that is possible within the church because greater is he that is in us than that which is in the world. See, joy is different than happiness. Happiness exists on a, on a binary. Either you're happy or you're sad. But joy exists all along the spectrum. It is in the ups and the downs because despite the circumstances, joy recognizes that it's all a gift. Life, breath, sweat, tears, anger, elation, calm, nervousness. Joy holds life in its bosom and it inhales wonder and exhales gratitude. Why? Because it's all a gift. And we get to live this. How will the world know and experience the kind of life Jesus experienced? When they come in contact, when they walk through these doors and they see in the faces and in the lives of the church gathered, despite the circumstances, a joy that wells up from deep inside of us because we know the whole thing's a gift. And when you live from that place, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That's joy. And that's what Jesus prays for. He seems to think that if the world's going to know that this life is possible, when people walk into, when they come in contact with the church, this unshakable, <laughs> undefinable joy that wells up from within us is going to convince them that God loves them. Jesus prays that they, those who know him, and the life that he comes to bring would be filled with joy and that they would be one so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then, so that they, you and I, would be brought to unity, oneness, connection, communion with each other. Then the world will know. Know what? That God sent Jesus and that God loves them. To the church gathered here on Easter, in terms of the world knowing that God loves them, Jesus seems to think that our experience of joy and our ability to be united as one body is way more important than our atonement theories. Our ability to live from experience, overflow this joy, and to be one as a body is more important than what we believe about creation and how long it took to make the world or, or baptism or communion or the sacraments or eschatology or when God's coming back or elders in the church or all the number of things that the church argues about all the time. Jesus seems to think that they might be completely united. One, then the world will know that you sent me and love them. In a few weeks, we're coming back to the series. We call it Wells and Fences, precisely because it is, its premise is on this idea that it is not that 
what's most important is not that we have all our theological furniture arranged just so, but rather that when people come into our house, they sense this unmistakable joy, this inexplicable joy, and that they are welcomed into a community who is united as one around the life and teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. So question, church, how are we doing? Jesus thinks that that, our experience of joy welling up inside of us despite our circumstance and our oneness as a community is more important, is the most important thing if the world is to know who and what God is like. How are we doing? On this Easter morn, as we think about Jesus' last dying wishes in John chapter 17, an invitation to those who do not yet know and have not yet experienced this life, Jesus testifies to and claims is available here and now. All the brokenness, all the estrangement, all the isolation, all the things that might be your normal have been stared down and buried and left in the grave when Jesus rolls the tomb away and walks out. So step into that flow. Say yes to that invitation. That one that Jesus is always offering. And to the church gathered this morning, may we be found with a full measure of joy. The kind of joy that is not dependent upon our circumstance or what the news is saying. May we be found with the full measure of joy that Christ wants to give that allows us to breathe in wonder and exhale gratitude because we're anchored in the divine life that screams from the mountaintops, greater am I in you than that which is in the world, and I have overcome It's not your typical Easter passage, but I think it's a pretty good one. Pray with me. God, this morning, as we consider the claims of Easter, that you are good and that you love us so much so that you made yourself known to us, you revealed yourself to us in Jesus the Christ who became a human, lived a life, taught this way of being, this modeled what it looked like to live in communion, in union with you in the divine life, and then said, it's this way, follow me. Upon resurrecting from the dead, beating death and evil and darkness and all that it stands for, and all that it has to offer, which is death itself, has no victory has no sting when Jesus comes out of the grave. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, in the next few moments that you would speak whatever word we need to hear this morning. If that's a word of encouragement or admonishment, a word of invitation, a word of welcome home, welcome back. Holy Spirit, we're open and awake to whatever you might be saying in this moment. There's a world at war Caught in suffering Silent casualties Oh God, grant us peace In these sleepless nights I can hardly breathe Despite brutality I know that all of Keep it shining Let it break into the darkness All the love there's us to see We'll all be free And in these desperate times Love will hold us here Love will join our hands Teach us to have no fear So we Hey
friends, uh, I hope that our time together caused you to think deeply about this claim about Jesus, who he was, what he taught, ultimately what he did. Before I offer a benediction to you, I know that Easter brings all kinds of guests and people maybe nosing around the church. And so just a couple things about Awaken. Um, if you're interested in joining a community and being a part of our life together, uh, there's a learning lab coming up. It's Wednesdays in the month of April. And we're going to be looking at this idea of, it's called pietism, which is really informative uh, for our community. And it shapes who we are and how we hold the things we hold. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. One of my dear friends, um, Dr. Clifton Soderstrom from North Park is going to be leading that. So Wednesdays in April. Also, uh, if you're new and want to find out more about the church, we do something called Discover Awaken. That's happening on April 11th from 10 to 12. You can register online. That's a Zoom link. Uh, and I lead that. So it's a chance to just hear more about Awaken, ask questions, get to know me a little bit more in the church. Would love to see you at that. And then if you're if you're all in here and you want to become a partner, which is what we call members, our next class is April 18th and 25th. So you can sign up for those things online. Uh, just a couple ways to kind of take steps towards getting involved at Awaken. So um, if any of those are applicable to you, uh, please follow those links and sign up. Um, that's it. That's all we've got. So receive this blessing as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said together, amen. Grace and peace.